morning uh, meeting of the House Appropriations Committee, and we're going to be skipping around on our agenda a bit. The um, Commerce Committee is still uh, putting some finishing touches and a vote on their bill. And so we have Representative Coburn with us who uh, would like to present a possible amendment that she may propose today um, to us and on the floor. So uh, welcome, Celine, and you have the floor. Teresa, can you pull the amendment up so that we're all seeing it on the screen? Yes, can you hang out? Uh, I'm, I just want to finish this email and I'll throw it right up just. Okay, you... okay. Teresa, um, Celine, while she is getting prepared to put it up on the screen, do you just want to um, say some opening thoughts about the gist of the, gist of the email and? Absolutely. Oh, thank um, you. For the record, um, Representative Selena Colburn from Burlington. Um, and here to talk about a potential amendment to H 966. And so um, just to uh, be clear, this amendment really isn't intended as an amendment to the amendment that's coming to you from commerce and not to the whole body of H966. So I, I will talk conceptually about what the amendment is and does with the um, recognition that the um, you know, it's amending something that sounds like it's it's continues to be in a little bit of progress and evolution as we speak. But um, I think I can give you the general sense of things. Thank you. And we so, have our screen now. Do you see it as well, Selena? Do you? I do. I do. And I have it. I have it called up as well for myself. Um, and just tell Teresa when to scroll down so we keep up. Sure. You. I'll start just by talking a little bit about the context of the amendment and and I'll I'm just going to be uh, very frank here about what um, has led me and others to bring this forward for your consideration. And I think it really grew out of a sense of frustration or maybe just concern and questioning about the balance of how money is going out in our COVID relief. Um, funding with these CRF funds, and particularly the balance between sort of workers, workers and businesses, and business owners. Um, so we, I think, some of us have really wanted to see more direct aid to low and moderate wage wage workers who've really been the engine of our economy in recent months and have some questions about what I would call um, perhaps some trickle down strategies with debatable efficacy in some of our funding models. Um, so you have another supporting document that I shared and I think this was something that came to your committee a few weeks ago in the form of a letter and certainly went to the Commerce Committee uh, where Representative Kornheiser testified on behalf of a number of us about it. And it was just something that came out of um, some members of the Working Vermonters Caucus and Women's Caucus had worked on this and it's called the Fair Jobs Proposal. So the idea behind this was in the, that in the absence of more direct aid to workers, that we would consider tying grants or loans to businesses to worker what we believe are worker friendly policies and you'll see a number of them outlined in that proposal including the one i'm going to talk about in this amendment um, that proposal was not amend adopted by the commerce committee as i think you're aware and so this amendment really came forward as kind of a last ditch effort to do what I would call the bare minimum for workers by conditioning grants on an executive worker pay ratio. And this is essentially so the state would not be subsidizing businesses who either had failed to do or weren't willing to commit to kind of the necessary internal work to ensure that any cost that they were taking the cost saving measures they could to protect their most vulnerable workers. So at this point, I'll kind of walk you through the amendment and talk about it, what it does. Um, 
it's really intended to only cover this package of this most recent package of grants, um, largely to the business sector that are, is coming out of house commerce. So it wouldn't, I did not intend for this to apply to that first round of grants to businesses, to the health and human services funding um, that we put forward earlier this week or to the other parts, the, um, the housing and connectivity parts of H966. Um, so let's see, so it, that, that is the first section is it really talks about um, the recipient of the monies appropriated from the coronavirus relief fund in this section. And then it goes on to say, shall not provide a grant or other assistance to a business that has one or more full-time employees. So it's, we're, we're trying to limit the one person shop here um, and have this not apply to that. So one or more full-time employees. And, and then it requires a pay ratio, essentially in which the highest paid owner or employee of the business cannot make 20 times more than the annual compensation of the lowest paid full-time employee. And we, we went with, I went with full-time employees just to avoid the kind of pay disparities that might come if someone was you know, on the books working five hours a month and then being compared to a, a full-time employee. Um, and, and then it talks about in section two or subsection two, I should say, about how eligibility would be determined and we, I was quite, um, tried to go broadly here. So a business can provide um, documentation in the form of financial records that they have historically held to this pay ratio, or they can, if that documentation is hard to come by or to produce in a meaningful way, they can submit an attestation that they comply and it also allows for businesses to commit moving forward over a period of five years to, um, to enact that pay ratio. So even a business that hadn't historically done this could still obtain eligibility um, by committing to do so moving forward. And so, that's the mechanics of the amendment. And I'll tell you a little bit about, a little more about the why. Um, so just just getting into the math, and I know um, I'm not in a math committee, you are, but by my calculations, and these are rough estimates, someone earning $11 an hour, which is just a few cents over our minimum wage, um, working full time makes approximately twenty two thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars a year, which is a sobering thing to consider, I think. And that would mean that in that instance, um, a business would be eligible as long as the highest paid worker didn't make four hundred and fifty seven thousand $7,600 a year. So almost half a million dollars there. If we looked at the state's livable wage calculation for a single parent with just one child um, in an urban area where that's um, the livable wage is set, I believe at approximately $30 an hour, that would be an annual income of $62,400. And that would mean that the highest paid worker could not earn more than a million two hundred and forty eight thousand dollars So a million and a quarter. Um, and then in a rural district where the livable wage is approximately $20 an hour, that drops down to an annual salary of $41,600 a year. And that would mean that then the um, highest paid worker salary would have to cap out at $832,000. 
So this is really about trying to get and I will say there's a couple ways in the way the amendment is constructed that folks could meet this criteria. Um, if they don't already, they could do it certainly by raising the floor um, of wages for their lowest paid workers, but they could also do it if that's not a possibility and perhaps for many it wouldn't be um, in the current conditions of our economy, they could, they could also do that by um, making some reductions to to executive pay or the um, pay of highest paid workers. So there are a couple of ways that businesses could comply with this. And really what we're trying I'm trying to get at here is um, the issue of income disparity. So there's a recent study that actually came out just this week. I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at it, but it was conducted by researchers in the Larner College of Medicine. And it does a really good job quantifying what I think we, a lot of us already theoretically um, would expect, which is that low income Vermonters are disproportionately bearing the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and the form some of the forms that are taking that is taking is lost income, reduced access to food, and higher rates of deferred medical care. So we're there we're seeing deferred medical care across the board because in some instances less medical care has been offered, but those deferrals are disproportionately impacting lower income Vermonters, which tells us that's not just about the question of availability of services. There's also emerging evidence at the national level that low income folks have actually really been the drivers of our economy during this time. So upper and middle class consumers went into kind of a bunker mentality spending considerably less while lower income consumer consumers continued to spend at their usual levels. And that's probably because they're only spending on necessities before, during, and after COVID because of the available resources that they have. Um, we've also seen a free flow of federal money uh, with, that's been dispensed with really an emphasis on expediency over oversight and that's already led to a lot of questions about um, for example whether the paycheck protection program really went to the people who need it in our economy or whether it continued to subsidize businesses who are doing well and who could potentially have absorbed the cost of this crisis. Um, at the local level we've heard warnings from the state economist and the auditor about being really mindful about this balance in our work here. So we all, of course, wanna get Vermont's economy up and running again. And I know your committee has just been working absolutely over time to ensure that that's the case. And I thank and applaud you. Um, and we all wanna get, but we also all wanna get resources to Vermonters who need them most. And I think to do the latter, we do need to have some criteria, some, some thresholds that ensure that we're reaching those who are most impacted by this crisis. We know our CRF monies are not unlimited, unfortunately, and it's likely not gonna be enough to address the long-term or even the short-term needs in our economy right now. I mean, we, we continue to see food distribution sites um, full up and having to turn people away in this state. Thank you, Selena. Um, I, I just need one piece of clarification. Did you um, did you present this amendment to the uh, Commerce Committee? This this the amendment that's before us. I haven't presented it to the Commerce Committee yet. Um, I, I I frankly haven't been invited. I think they've. Been, I mean, I was told by Chair Marcotte that I would be. Um, but I think they've been so deep in the work of just crafting this amendment that they have not had time to consider an amendment to their mm -hmm. amendment. I know they were working, you know, into last evening and sounds like picked it right back up this morning. I will say um, 
I'll just say by way of closing, because I think that might address it might address that question as well. I think that for me and for the working Vermonters caucus members who are in support of this amendment, what we're really saying here is that a bare at a bare minimum, the state should be prioritizing assistances to businesses that don't have or don't intend to continue dramatic pay disparities, particularly at a time when we know that income inequalities are really amplified and amplified with some really dire consequences for working class Vermonters. So I'm, I'm definitely eager to hear your thoughts on this amendment. I will say that with what I, hope will continue to be the addition of hazard pay to the Commerce Committee's amendment. I think your committee for, I believe your committee did a fair share of work on that. And I, I really thank you for that. My sense of urgency about this has shifted a little bit in the last 24 hours. Um, this amendment really was born, like I said, out of frustration about the balance between aid to workers and um, workers and, and businesses and business owners. So I'm, I'm eager to hear your thoughts, um, but I'm, I am also really heartened by the inclusion of hazard pay, assuming that um, when you do get that amendment from commerce, that it, it continues to be a part of what we'll get to vote on today. And so I, you know, I'm open to hearing your thoughts on this amendment, um, both on this vehicle or if there's other ways that you think are, um, we could get at this question of pay disparity. Um, thank you, Selena. Um, I, I'm just checking with, um, I, I just wanna make sure um, you're amending you're amending their amendment, but it's our bill. So I, I just wanna make sure um, that it's not Commerce who needs to, since it's their amendment, but since it's our bill, it would be us. So I think it's still us that would entertain the amendment. I just wanna make sure that we're following the right rules of where the amendment uh, should be first proposed. So you, um, you're unsure at this time if it's coming up on the floor or not, uh, the amendment, or are you offering it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Last question, Representative Toll. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm confused. Are you offering this for sure or will you make a decision on the floor? I will make a decision on the floor and my decision will, would be guided, I think, by um, both your committee's input and reception of this amendment, but also by understanding what is coming, what is coming forward in the amendment. Commerce Amendment. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly, I have your hand up, and um, I, we, have, uh, we have another bill that's uh, on uh, before us. So let's, um, at nine o'clock, let's get six. Let's do some uh, question and answering here, and some thoughts here, and then I we really need to move to another bill too. I'm sorry, everything is so compressed, Selena, and I apologize for that. It's totally understood. Um, I have Kimberly, Mary, Peter. So Selena, I think you make a really compelling case and I just want to thank you and all the people that you've worked with in the caucus and outside the building, proverbial building, <laughs> to make this happen. And my question is the very last part on B, that five year piece. Can you just uh, elaborate that just a tad more? Sure, I think the thought was if someone is, and I'm just gonna call it the language, so I'm looking at it right with you. So. Oh, and I apologize, there is an F-35 flying over my house, so you may struggle to hear me for a moment. Can you hear it? Yep. Um, so th this essentially says that for people who are, um, haven't historically complied, but are saying I'm willing to do this moving forward that they would attest to that commitment for not less than five years following the date of the award. So they couldn't just say, oh, I'll do that and do it for a month and, and go back to um, historic pay ratios. Great, Does that make okay. Sense? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary. Um, I 
hope it isn't a surprise to my committee or, or to you, Representative Colburn, that I'm interested, really like the fundamental concept that you're asking us to consider. I, I think these are important questions that we need to be asking ourselves um, as, as we construct budgets and as we support Vermonters. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, we're the committee of math, but also mechanics. And um, so I'm figuring at a minimum wage um, rate, which is you know, likely to be the lowest um, paid um, person, um, ha is the lowest paid. So we're talking 21,776. So the 20 times, just to be clear about what we're talking about is $435,512. Um, so that's the range that we have to be, that this tells us to pay attention to. And I don't know what we're amending, um, is it, but it's clear to me that some of the grant recipients, particularly the hospitals, will be outside of this range. But it's my understanding that's not one of the bills that you're interested in amending. Is that correct? That is correct. So I, this would not apply to the health and human services funds um, that we, we, we approved. It would not even apply to that first round of business grants that we've already approved to those experiencing 75% loss. It's only intended to apply to the provisions um, that are coming forward in this most recent commerce committee packet, where in particular the, the business grants um, my understanding, and I, I was listening to their testimony, their discussion and testimony last night. I can't, I cannot tell you what's going to come forward to you now, but the, the criteria for most of the recipients, the threshold of loss has been lowered to 50%. Yeah. Um, so it, it really is intended only to, um, apply to the, those recipients that yeah. they're identifying in their forthcoming amendment. And the mechanics part of this is, so they attest that they plan to uh, abide by these conditions. And so we're going to have to monitor that for five years going forward. Had, had you thought about how mechanically this would work? And then we're going to have to claw back the grants if they don't work. And who would be doing that? So I, I haven't given a lot of thought to that. I mean, I think the attestation is as it's described here, um, and I don't see legislative counsel on the um, call to, I'm sure because he is with the Commer Commerce Committee right now. Uh, I mean, this is really meant to be a fairly low, low bar good faith attestation, um, which I recognize has um, then lots of questions attached to it. I will say that I listened to um, Tom Covet's testimony from um, earlier in the week in commerce. And this was a question that he posed about all of our CRF funds and particularly in light of some of what's coming what we're starting to understand about the lack of oversight at the federal level is like what balance should we consider um, investing in administrative oversight over all of these funds. Um, and so I think that in some ways is a question that's even larger than this amendment, but I, I, I can't tell you that I have a clear and thorough proposal for you about how that would work. The scale of the grants we're going to be giving is going to be teeny, sadly, um, through this program. I wonder if this isn't more, wouldn't be more effective attached to the policy that drives the veggie or the VITA programs where they actually give significant grants and you might be able to get at those, at, at the fundamental issues that you're talking about. 
it, it's an intriguing policy. I'm just not sure where the, this is the right vehicle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Peter, and then uh, we'll have to come back to this because I have a whole other committee government operations in here that um, I need to move back to. And Selena, I'm sorry, but we're, we're jumping back and forth all day long. So Peter, and then um, we'll come back to this amendment, please. Hi, Selena, thank you for coming in. You know, when we all do better, we all do better. And, and so I absolutely understand and what you're trying to do here and you're trying to raise everybody up and I, I agree. Uh, just, I, I have some some rather pointed questions. So how many businesses are gonna be impacted by this? Um, what parts of the state are they in? And uh, and uh, who specific, what specific businesses would be impacted? Um, I think I caught the tail end of a question for me. Sorry. Representative Hellman, I'm so sorry, my screen Rose, um, okay. and then so, uh, Representative Cooper's question. Oh, Representative Fagan, I apologize. Yeah, so let me, so yeah, no, that's okay. So I, I started off by saying, you know, I understand. And as I said, when we all do better, we all do better. So hopefully, you know, you, you, this is a discussion that needs to continue. Um, but how many businesses statewide would this impact? Uh, how many of those businesses have applied for uh, or might apply for a, a CRF grant on, under this. Um, where are they and, and, and who are they? I don't think I can answer that question for you without, without access to the Commerce Committee's final proposal. Okay. Um, I, I'm you know, I, I would also ask how many jobs are at risk if, if those businesses don't receive a grant um, what happens to those employees that if, that if that business goes out of business because they do not receive a grant, um, are there enough jobs to backfill all those employees that, that go out of business? So th those are my questions. You know, I well, know that they're, they're nitty gritty. Sorry, but those I, are the... I think I can respond to the second question. I think your, your first question is spot on, but I just simply can't quantify that for you at this point. Um, okay because we just don't have we don't have the uh, the final okay. amendment in front of right. us <laughs> but, but the second question as as representative hooper um rightly i think pointed out um these are going to be small grants uh, unfortunately a small number of grants ultimately that there is no way that we're i think likely to meet the demand um, for assistance that will be out there. And so what this essentially would create is some prioritization, um, which I've heard from the state economists is actually what we should be doing with some of these funds to ensure that the businesses who are receiving state subsidies have done the necessary work to um, you know, make make the progressive internal and by progressive I simply mean like that they have addressed this pay disparity issue and that the funds that we're sending are then more likely to impact workers those frontline workers those lower paid workers in the businesses we're supporting okay I, I have some other questions but I'm just going to ask the one mechanical question that Mary started down the uh, the path of asking and and um Maybe she did, but I'll phrase it differently. So if at the four year mark, a business does not comply, um, those funds would need to be returned to the federal government. Um, how are we going to effectuate that? So that's the, the, that's the question because those funds are no longer ours. They are ours to be spent by 31 December, as you know. And if we decide four years down the road that you did not spend them in accordance with, with the uh, statute, then we're going to claw them back, but they're not ours to keep. So, so I think that's. Oh, oh, go ahead, Selena. And that's, and that's it. Selena, go ahead. Oh, I think I think that is a really important mechanical question, Representative Fagan, and um, uh, I I think it's a question. My understanding is it's a question that ACCD is grappling with a bit in the in the larger sense about oh, oversight yes. 
of all of the, all of these funds um, and how they're going to find the resources right. and how that's going to work. Right. Um, and I think you know if, if this was an amendment that the the either committee was seriously interested in, I think we could look at at resolving that, thinking about whether the five year mark really does create more problems than it solves. Um, but I'd certainly be open to looking at that with you if I had the sense that this was something you know you really wanted to move forward at this time. But I do think it's part of a larger issue beyond this amendment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Peter. Brian. Thank you, Selena. Um, we don't have the amendment in front of us, so for us to take a position on amending something that we don't have with, I, I'm not comfortable doing the cart before the horse. Um, I, I think from hearing the committee, that we certainly understand the sentiment behind it. I think we're concerned with some of the mechanisms and um, you know how it would be rolled out and, and also would the state of Vermont, that money ha would have to go back to the federal government um, even if we didn't collect it, we would then, uh, the, the state would have to repay those dollars, I believe, from what I've heard from the Joint Fiscal Office, um, that ultimately we're responsible for those um, monies. So um, I think that we need to hear from Mike Marcotte and also uh, hear what their committee is, is thinking, and then we will circle back to this. Um, so I, I don't want to take action until we actually have their amendment to actually amend, you know, a possible amendment to. But thank you for bringing it in. And we're going to switch gears and go to H um, uh, S three forty nine. It's a municipal. Um, it's a municipality bill getting CRF dollars out to um, our municip our municipalities. And let's see, who do I have? I have Representative Gannon, Representative Harrison. I'm looking around my screen. Representative Gardner, um, Abby Shepard. And uh, from JFO, uh, no, we have from Legislative Council, Abby Shepard. Thank you. I, I apologize, not, not JFO, um, Legislative Council. Which one is it? She's Legislative Council. She's Abby. Legislative Council. I said JFO. I apologize, Abby. So welcome. Um, Maida, this is your bill. And so uh, I'd like to hear from Representative Gannon. You can um, just do the overview. And then I would, are you having Abby just do a quick walkthrough of the bill? Yes, um, Madam Chair, that's that's what our, our plan is. So uh, this Kitty? is a- Yes? Kitty, just where yes. can I find the, the, the current language that they are actually offering? Because there's a lot of email in my email chain here. So S349 has not changed since I, ha I gave it to you last night and I gave it to you this morning and it's also in the OneDrive in the bills folder and on the committee webpage. Thank you. And, and, and John, just before you start, I do want to explain to Representative Coburn that we have uh, two bills that we need to get to the floor by 10 o'clock. That's why I'm pushing this so hard. I'm, I'm really not being dismissive. I want to wait till uh, Commerce's bill is here, but we have to. There, if, if we pass these out, we need them passed out by ten o'clock, and we're just under a huge time constraint. And so I apologize because I think our conversation could have gone on much longer um, uh, on, on the pros, but also of some concerns that we have. So please know I'm not. I'm not. You know, setting anything aside. I, I just need to hear this. Our committee needs to hear this bill and consider it if, if it's going to make it to the floor today. So John? Can John just, I'm sorry, Kitty Giant, I'm like sort of with Peter, could John, can you, when you start whoever, can you just tell us what draft number and what time, just to make sure we've got the right one. Thanks. And Teresa is going to put it up on the screen so we will see that, so you all follow the same one. And I think maybe so, people got confused because Abby sent two drafts this morning and it's just, they're the same, it just, um, they basically just show it in a different manner. One's a strike all to make it easier to view. And Abby can explain this. Okay. They're, they're not different. So we're going to work off the strike all amendment so that everybody's on the same page. And that is draft 2.2 of S349. Um, so um, Abby can do a detailed walkthrough. I'm going to introduce it. And then um, uh, Representative Harris and Representative Gardner are gonna talk about the sections that they worked on. Um, and I will talk about the section I worked on. So this is a strike all amendment to the Senate um, bill. Um, the Senate bill originally um, requested um, $16 million, um, which was to basically go to cover 
COVID-19 um, municipal expenses. Um, we have uh, in our fiscal responsibility um, made a request for $10,200,000 total. Um, 5.2 million um, will go to reimbursing um, municipalities and solid waste districts for their COVID-19 related expenses. And another $5 million uh, will go to digitization of municipal land records. Um, so Marsha is gonna start off talking about the solid waste districts and their COVID-19 um, expenses. And then um, Jim is gonna talk about municipal COVID-19 re related expenses. And then I'm gonna talk about digitization of land records. Thank you, John. So are we, are we going to move to Marsha first or are we going to yes, do- Yes, Marsha first. Yeah. Okay, okay, Marsha, welcome. I tried to unmute myself on this end. Uh, am I coming through to everyone? Yes, you are. Good. So um, our solid waste workers were on the front line of COVID uh, in the very beginning. They were considered essential service employees and their companies have incurred expenses because of this. Um, PPE, um, thermometers, things to keep them safe as they worked through this crisis. So they have come to us asking for some reimbursement for uh, the expenses that they have incurred. And there are 10 solid waste districts. Um, their president, uh, Paul Tomasi, was able to contact them, pull together numbers from all of them, and their total ask is $173,174,000, which we have rounded up to $200,000 in case they have some extra expenses going forward. And I think that's all I have, unless people have questions. Thank you, Marsha. We're going to go right to the next section and hold the questions for the end. Uh, Thank you. We get through this. And just for the committee's sake, I need to uh, wrap this up um, a little before 9.30 because we have all of Commerce who has now come to the table and we may have to come back to this bill. But for the committee, I want you to hear all the, the testimony from the Committee of Jurisdiction. So um, Representative Harrison, I believe you're next. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, if you. If I sound garbled, please tell me, I'll shut off my video feed. No, you're good right um, now. Okay. Um, so my section of the bill um, is dramatically changed in the sense of the appropriation from the Senate. Um, we are allocating $5 million uh, instead of 16. Um, and for grants to local government. Basically, uh, we worked with the League of Cities and Towns. They took a survey of their members. Uh, about the 100 that responded, uh, the expenses for one month in April ranged from zero to $200,000. Uh, these are the extra COVID-related expenses, sometimes alterations to town halls, sometimes overtime, sometimes you know, PPE equipment, et cetera. Um, this does not include potential county expenses. So as um, Abby can walk through, uh, we put some bumper guards in. We wanted to make sure that if the grants exceeded or the grant requests exceeded the amount that they could be prorated uh, and that some preference was given to uh, small communities. This may or may not happen, um, additionally, there is $150,000, which was in the Senate version of that $5 million that is allocated for uh, regional planning commissions to do the technical assistance. Again, this would probably help small towns more than, uh, say, perhaps a large city. Um, so um, there are, again, some additional bumper guards in terms of how it's allocated. Uh, again, Abby can walk through that. Uh, these types of arrangements were in the Senate, just downsized a little bit for the House version because we're dealing with less money. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, and now, John, you were going to do the last section. 
Yes. So during the COVID-19 emergency, um, most town clerk's offices were closed. Um, and so the access to municipal land records was severely circumscribed. Um, so many Vermonters were unable to engage in real estate transactions, whether that was buying or selling real estate, or more importantly, refinancing their mortgages. Many people are refinancing their mortgages right now um, to put themselves in a better position um, in case they have already lost their jobs or anticipate losing their jobs because of COVID-19. Um, so what this proposal does is appropriate $5 million to digitize um, municipal land records. Um, this will not cover all towns uh, across the state. That would cost $18 million. Um, what we are doing is prior prioritizing town clerk's offices that were closed, were, where access was severely restricted, and pr prioritizing towns that had a high number of real estate transactions based on the data from the Department of Taxes property transfer tax data. Um, so basically this would allow um, a certain amount of towns to provide online access to their municipal <laughs> land records, which would allow attorneys and others to do title searches um, and get um, Vermonters able to access what's probably their largest asset, their home. Thank you. Thank you, John. And so this would be um, perhaps a, a first phase of a longer program to <clears throat> to provide digit dig digitization <clears throat> across the state. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay. And th this is this idea came from the dig digitization tax force. I'm having trouble pronouncing that word too. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've been working on this for some time. Um, and you know, this is a way to ensure that many people can, can access the, the value of their home. Thank you, John. And so Abby, when we walk through this bill, I don't want to read it. Uh, we've all read it on our own last night. We, we received these copies. We just need to, uh, there was some comments when members read it last night that the numbers weren't adding up. And so we need to make sure that the numbers are adding up, I believe, to a total of $10,200,000. $10, but if you would just uh, walk through the highlights of the bill, because we've heard from the three members and we've all read the language. So I don't want to do a a word by word, please. Peter, a question? Yes, thanks, Kitty. Really, it's, it's before we go word, you know, before we do this, this walkthrough. Um, I just wanted to ask about the solid waste district piece. Um, I know that, that uh, Casella has had to pick up a lot of, uh, a lot of expenses statewide for the uh, solid waste districts. Is the intent here to make sure that, that an organization that has, like Casella, stepped up um, done more than perhaps they were, uh, they thought that they would need to do at the start of this, uh, is the intent here to ensure that they get um, a, a proportionate share of this $200,000? Well, each, each um, solid waste district submitted a number. And so Chittenden County has a substantially higher number than many of the other solid waste districts. So I'm hoping that, uh, that they have added in everything that they felt was appropriate to reimburse them for what they have done. So, that, but the question, obviously Casella is not a solid waste district. They, they provide services too. So the question is, is whether they will be part of this uh, package that's been put together. I can find out about that. They are not listed separately. Right. If you would, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you Peter. Um, and then Mary, and then we're going to move to the walkthrough of the bill, please. Um, with regard to the money for digitization, um, that can be a long, complex, difficult process. And I am concerned that this get done within the time frame that we're able to do it. And so I would suggest that somehow we, and I see the reporting section for August 15th, but somehow we need to know if how much of this 
money is actually going to be spent so that we can pull it back. And I would rather not wait until December 20th when we're pulling back others to drop into the pot. I would like to know in August so that we can redirect it. So I'm just suggesting that we may want to have some reporting on numbers there so that we can pull it back and reuse it. Yes, Thanks. we did take testimony with respect to the ability to do this by December 30th, 2020. Um, and they indicated both the, the clerks and treasurers association as well as the other um, proponents of this bill that this could be done um, by December. I, again, yeah, I'd like to have those so that yeah. we know. No, I got I mean, it. You're, you're also gonna have the issue of if this was a work in progress prior to Will it be eligible for these funds? It, it was not a work in progress. There was just a task force set up to look at this issue. I'll take it offline with you guys. Thank you. Okay, so my, my question is, Mary, are you asking for an additional language change on the reporting or you just want to be sure government operations gets the, um, and MEDA will track this, that we know how the money is going out when we come back in August, that we get a, so that we get a better feeling of it? I hate to ask for a language change because I know what that means, but it's just weekly updates and report, but not an accounting of the money. So I'm suggesting that. I, I'm open to the committee telling me and the other committee telling me that's not necessary, we've got it covered, but I'm saying this is a concern I have. Um, I, I think that's an easy language change that we could make. Okay, thank you. So you would offer that on the floor, John? Um, we have not voted this out of committee yet, so. There um, we go. But we can tweak yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, we have. Um, we did take a straw poll, 11 okay. zero, zero, but... of this, and, and okay, is, is my understanding is, is this to be on the floor today or is this a Monday issue? Monday, uh, at okay. the earliest. Okay, so for the committee, what I'm going to do now is we're going to, um, I would like to, um, I would like to then, um, I really need to get to the, the economic development bill because it needs to be on the floor, John. So I'm, I'm apologizing uh, for this. We were trying to squeeze in a lot of pieces uh, when we had a bit of extra time. And so what I would like to do now, if I could get a walkthrough of the bill very quickly from legislative council, we're going to hold our questions and send them through MEDA and, and, and have made a uh, relate them to you so that we can get to the economic development bill. And I, I, it's not that one is more important than the other, but they're on different time schedules. Totally understand, thank you. So Abby, let's walk through this uh, quickly, please, if we could. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, for the record, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Council. Um, I think just to answer your question about the amounts, um, I'm glad actually we have the strike all as the draft that we're looking at because it really lays out how the appropriations are split. So there are, it is a total of 10.2 million. There's 5.2 million going for the local government um, in general, and then that split into three buckets. And then there's the 5 million for the digitization. So the 5.2, what might have oh. been confusing was that there is the 4.85 million that's going to cities, towns, um, and their various um, expenses. There's a hunt up to 150,000 that will be going to um, one or more regional planning commissions for technical assistance. And then there's the 200,000 that would be for solid waste districts. So there is, it is 5.2. It might've, I don't think I highlighted the 150,000. Maybe that's why it was, um, sort of off the radar of the committee. Okay, thank you. So um, the first section and section one, um, it adds an appropriation of the agency of administration. It's only for eligible COVID-19 expenses. Um, it's all of the same requirements that you've been seeing for your different um, CRF funding bills. So they do have to meet the federal requirements. The types of uses are not explicit or exhaustive. In this list, it provides possible uses, which include hazard pay, supplies, equipment, um, sanitation facility, all the alterations, overtime, 
redirection of staff and any expenses not covered by other funding sources, such as FEMA. So if there are other bills that are providing funding sources, then um, localities would not be eligible under this bill for this appropriation. So if we scroll on down to subsection B, the secretary of administration or their designee, um, it was opened up in case um, the secretary wishes to designate um, the development of this program, such as to ACCD. Um, they must develop grant guidelines for determining the eligibility and also requirements for reimbursement. So there's an overall requirement um, for the secretary or designee to come up with um, guidelines for this. And, and what's a change here from the Senate bill, the underlying S349 bill, is that the Committee on Government Operations proposed prioritizing need, in particular local unemployment rates, and the percent of the eligible expenses relative to the total budget. So that's a slight change from the underlying bill. Um, also, because the overall amount was reduced, um, subsection C sets out those three buckets for how the 5.2 million will be distributed. Um, and this is a new cap for, so it's 4.85 million. Um, there is a new cap of $200,000 per recipient for a reimbursement of the expenses. Um, and it's split out into counties in subdivision A versus cities, towns, unorganized town scores, et cetera, in subsection B, just because of the way that counties would um, be using the money and the, the head count, because it's based, there's a maximum based on um, the number of uh, the population in that area. So counties get um, $1 per person, cities, towns, et cetera, um, only get up to $20 per person. This language is again different from the Senate by no longer having a minimum. The Senate um, S349 did create a minimum for the very small towns. So this that minimum is removed in this language. In subdivision two, that's the 200,000 um, allocation to solid waste management districts. This is only for those that are organized under Title 24, Chapter 121. It allows the secretary or designee to create the limitations to the amount of grants allocated. Um, so it's not a per head type of um, split. In subdivision three, this is the up to $150,000. Um, I believe that certain regional planning commissions worked with JFO to come up with this number in the Senate. So that's to provide technical assistance to any of these units of local government um, to identify and document their expenses. And the language, again, from the Senate allowed that contract to be a sole source if necessary. Um, subdivision four um, states that if there is an excess of in requests based on the amount uh, appropriated, the secretary may prorate and the house government operations added um, a priority for municipalities that are on the smaller end, so under 2,500 in population. Um, so this section does require a reporting requirement. It is different from the digitization. So it's one month later at September 15th. Um, the secretary of administration has to report to um, the Joint Fiscal Committee, um, and then also provide any legislative changes. So okay, that's for the. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. That was that's for the first section, and I apologize. I'm not as familiar with the following sections, so I might just give you a very. I realize we're probably running out of time. Um, we're going to we we've read the definitions, and so we can okay. move through the definitions. So, so this is for the digitization um, appropriation of five million. Uh, sorry, so we can scroll down. Um, and what's highlighted was from some of the committee discussion yesterday where a uh, suggestion was to make sure that um, any recipient of these funds has to actually put the land records online. So that's a requirement from this. Um, so a municipality may apply for a grant for an eligible use. Um, and I'm, I may, I don't know if there are any particular questions on this. Again, I apologize, I wasn't the drafter of these sections. Um, so my knowledge is somewhat limited on the next few sections. If there are any questions, I could bring them back to the drafter. Okay, if there's questions, we're going to run those through Meta to you and to the Great. committee. Okay. Okay. Kitty? Yes, Peter? Just one, just one question, so this, this appropriates $15,250,000, is that correct? 
Uh, no, the, the, there are two different appropriations, one of 5.2 million and one of 5 million. So it's a total of, of 10.2. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, um, and then um, Teresa, are we, where do you want to be now, uh, Abby? Um, so we're on section three, looking at the 5 million appropriation. Um, and let's see, so the requirements for the grant applicants, I don't know if you want me to go through this? I'm, I'm not as familiar with this part of the bill, so I think it might be more um, helpful if there are any specific questions. Um, if uh, we are going to send the, as I said, we'll send those through. Okay. So let's let's continue through the, the Teresa, let's okay. scroll. And the next part, are there any other parts of this is all part of the grant process for the digitization? Digitization, right? correct. So there is a reporting requirement, um, okay. which there were questions there. And that, again, as um, Representative Gannon explained, this has not been offered yet. So we can make any changes that you'd like. Okay, and Dr. Mary, Anders, will, and can make those. thank you, Abby. Uh, Mary, you'll work with Meta to uh, okay. Section 4A, okay? And then um, the consultation, is this new? Um, so yeah. This does require um, the agency of administration to consult with the league, as well as the Municipal and Clerks and Treasurer Association and the Bar Association. So I believe that is a new addition. And then there is the reporting, both weekly updates, um, but also a, a report August 15th. So it is a month earlier than the report for the local government um, grants. Okay, and that's Mary, where you want to put in about the money that has gone out and can it actually be um, correct uh, and used by, yes, by the due yes. date and the effective dates. Abby, and thank you. I have rushed you. I really apologize for that and to the committee. Um, which excellent work. Um, we will uh, wait for your committee to take a vote because we can't take a position on it. Um, well, we can, but. You know, we'd like to hear from your committee and if in that one uh, change with reporting and any other changes the committee has, please send those through Meta today, uh, early today, um, so that uh, the, the committee can, the, the GovOps committee can finish their work. Thank you very much and thank you for your work. And um, as soon as those changes are made and you have a vote, let us know so that we can take action. Do you plan to vote today? Um, I will check with our chair, but we will try Perfect. to get this done. Okay, Thank you. the sooner you can vote, um, the sooner then we can look at the final, um, the final bill. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Gannon and Representative Harrison and Representative Gardner. And thank you, Abby, for the walkthrough of the bill. We are going to very quickly shift gears to, um, to the Commerce Amendment to the bill that's on the floor today for third reading at 10 o'clock. Welcome Representative Marcotte. Thank you for taking endless phone calls into late at night last <laughs> morning. Glad to uh, Madam Chair. I think all of our spouses have about had it with us. I don't know. <laughs> yep. so, no comment. Uh, so uh, I, Mike, um, at this point, should we just have legislative council walk through uh, the presentation or, were you, or Charlie who was going to walk through it? I think uh, if we let David walk you through it and then uh, we can answer any questions that you might have. Okay, and I would ask the committee just to jot their questions down on a piece of paper so that we can walk through the entire amendment. Um, let's see where I'm looking for David Hall, are you on? Oh, there you are, I just didn't, I just, it's like Hollywood Squares, but yeah. everybody <laughs> keeps shifting around. Um, Judy, can yes, I just Smith. ask, Teresa, where it is on the OneDrive? Does she have it up there yet, the most recent? Oh, I just barely put it in. Um, it, it, I just um, put it over the old one. So it's the phase two in the OneDrive, page 966. Nine, okay. Bills. Thank you. It was also emailed to us at 914 this morning. I know, but I need the draft number. One. This is the draft a number is 4.1.1 at 8.30. There's one extra page on here than the one that I've got for the right. I'll follow. Okay. This is this is the one that we're using, draft 4.1, and we'll have David Hall uh, walk through it. And we have all read various versions of this, and this is the final version. So be looking for any pieces that might conflict with what you uh, may be thinking of. 
David, welcome, and let's start our walkthrough, please. Sure, thank you. Good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, so this amendment to um, 966 has um, a couple of instances. The first instance of amendment on line six you'll see is to strike out and replace the purpose section because it needs to reflect the new totals for the expenditures in the bill. So <clears throat> those first two, well, the second, third numbers are unchanged relating to broadband and housing, but the fourth number is the total of the appropriations in the commerce package. And that includes commerce expenditures. That number, the 121.7 also includes the proposals that have been uh, incorporated from other committees um, allotments. So don't be confused by that. Um, and then the total of all three is 232, A30, 100. Thank you, David. And I just checked the math and you're right. Not that I didn't think you would be, but we had some questions earlier about what the totals were. So thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Please, I'll never be uh, upset about people double checking my math, which is, you may be surprised to know I didn't major in math in law school. So. <laughs> All right, um, on line 15, the second instance of amendment is uh, inserting the slate of commerce proposals. The way I've done this just mechanically is to make them numbered and lettered sections 10A through E. That way we don't have to mess around with renumbering a bunch of sections that follow. So um, you'll see in 10A subsection A on line 20 and into the next page, just the sort of the stock provision that this is necessary due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And then the appropriations start on line four. So these are all from the coronavirus relief fund, two named recipients for purposes specified. Um, the first Appropriation subdivision B1, $5 million to the Working Lands Enterprise Fund, which the Working Lands Enterprise Board shall use for grants to businesses within the agricultural, food and forest, and wood products industries. For uh, two different purposes, um, subdivision A and B, um, I, I have to Please allow me about 45 seconds to go turn off this. I hear that somebody's not turning off a kettle and I don't want to burn my house down. No, please go do that. We want to. <laughs> oh, these poor people. They're just working so oh, hard. Uh, they're, they're, yeah. it's, it, it, the, the demands have been brutal. Yeah. Teresa, oh, I, I, tell, tell me where to find it again. I have one version, but not a not a numbered line version. Right, I can't find let it me, either. Let me just pause and I'll send it to everybody now okay. and then share. I just can't do it while I'm sharing. So just- That's okay, worry. thank you. So Kitty, it might be helpful if, because like it's, it's one page difference. If he could just tell us where it's different so I don't have to reprint the whole thing or just where it's different, I'll print that page or something. I don't know, I need a good you mean, copy. You mean printed for you? Not well, just... it's for the copy yeah. for when we vote. I need to make sure I've got the right, that I reference the right document. You are referencing this document, which was 4.1. Um, 4.1. 4 yeah, and then I'd like to, when we're done, I'd like a good copy of it so I can send it. Yeah. Well, Teresa's about to email it to us, so. All right. I just did. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. We're just waiting to make sure that um, there is the tea kettle is safe. But I'm while here. we're just sorry. sorry about that, I I don't hear the the um, fire trucks coming up the road, so you're okay. M mercifully, uh, 
I'm not burning down my house. Thank you for your patience. I apologize. No, this is, we need to get some other, I'm going to print it. So I've got the right one. Okay, David, let's continue because we are on a tight time. Frame. All right, I'm going to go faster. So B1, $5 million working lens enterprise fund board will use it to pay out grants uh, A for recovering verifiable losses due to COVID-19 and B developing new products or markets necessary for the sustainable viability of businesses because changes in supply chain and relevant markets. So that's their $5 million. The next $5 million goes through the community loan fund. Um, it's two different allocations of two and a half million dollars for grants of not more than $10,000. Half is for women-owned businesses and half is for minority -owned businesses. So you'll be eligible if you suffered a 50% greater uh, loss between March and September from zero to five employees, uh, at least 50, 1% uh, women or minority owned and MISA standards at BGSF for their minor, minority owned program. And then you have to certify that you meet the requirements, the expenses are valid, you'll spend the money on time, it's subject to audit, fraudulent claims will be prosecuted, et cetera. Commission on Women will design an application and host an online application process. Commerce will provide notice to applicants about ex allowable expenditures and outreach efforts. And then the Commission on Women and a host nonprofit that works with minority businesses will conduct outreach necessary within their respective communities. If any of the funds are unencumbered or and unspent on September 20th, the agency and the fund can assess the participation rates in the two programs and re reallocate funds between them if necessary. Under three here, it's $3 million. Uh, through ACCD, through the program set up in S350 to provide emergency economic recovery grants to eligible businesses that provide highway and bridge maintenance services uh, for AOT or municipal highway departments or both that have suffered economic harm. Um, so that will be subject to all the criteria of section three of S350. That is the uh, transportation committee's proposal. Um, so division four, three million to tourism and marketing to provide marketing support to businesses that have suffered economic harm due to the uh, public health emergency. Number five, three million to commerce to establish this called Restart Vermont Technical Support Network. So that's an RFP out for professional uh, assistance to businesses, lawyers and architects and IT people, et cetera. That's $3 million. Um, you can scroll down to subdivision six. <clears throat> One million dollars uh, to DHCD for grants through what's called the Better Places program. That would be for leasing equipment or buying equipment like uh, masks, sanitizing stations, door pulls, outdoor tables and chairs, etc., to allow communities to adopt public safety measures uh, for outdoor events, etc. Uh, number seven here, this is $70.2 million. So this goes to ACCD in consultation with tax, but it's really, it's an allocation between the two programs already set up in S350. How they allocate that money, it will be subject to approval of the Joint Fiscal Committee. Um, there are some deviations from the standards in S350. You'll see, for instance, you'll see an A uh, this, it drops from 75% to a 50% loss between March and September. Um, under B, if not all of the monies are out from S350 by August 1st, then they will just roll those monies into this new pot and keep going. Under eight, uh, 1.5 million through ANR for the Outdoor Recreation Business Assistance Program. The program is spelled out in greater detail below in another section, but it's basically 30 up to $30,000 grants to uh, businesses, nonprofits, et cetera, to help adapt outdoor recreation uh, to public health measures. And that's from the Committee on Natural Resources. So uh, number nine here, $5 million. Uh, it's to Southeastern Vermont Community Action as a fiscal agent, but it's a statewide program Restaurants and Farmers Feeding the Hungry, uh, which will basically provide meals to Vermonters who are food secure through Vermont restaurants working with local farms. So you'll see in A, uh, SEVCA is supposed to work with partners throughout the state, in government and outside government. Um, under B, 
They will establish uh, multiple community scale hubs across Vermont, engage a broad range of restaurants. Um, we can keep going down next page. Uh, try to, on average, purchase at least 10% of the ingredients from local farms and augment existing food distribution network. Uh, the last one, number 10, $5 million to the Arts Council for grants to nonprofit arts and cultural organizations that have suffered a 50% or greater reduction in revenue, same standard. For this one, you'll see on line eight, revenue does not include tax deductible charitable donations. So we're talking about revenues they have lost from operations, not from donations. So C, uh, administration of funds and reporting. Um, so if you get an appropriation under this section, under one, you can use the funds for administrative expenses provided that the expenses represent an increase over previously budgeted amounts and are limited to what is necessary. That is a standard uh, based on directly on language in the FAQs and guidance. Under two, um, they have to require applicants to attest to the intended use to commit expending the funds by December 20th. Um, if it's a business organization, it has to be domiciled or have its primary place of business in Vermont. And then under D, um, it has to either be open at the time of application or closed, but have a good faith plan to reopen. Um, three, they have to disclose all expenditures are subject to audit and may change. Um, four, any funds that are both unencumbered and unspent as of November 15th will revert to ACCD for emergency economic recovery grants. And under five, there'll be initial reports on August 15th and final on November 15th concerning the appropriated funds. So D, prohibition on multiple sources of funding. So this is specific to the appropriations in this commerce proposal. Under D1, a business may apply for a grant of CRF monies from multiple sources provided, however, that under A, a business is eligible to receive only one grant of these monies from among the programs and sources authorized in the section and B, in general, if a business that receives a grant of CRF monies from another program of source that's not in this section cannot get a grant from programs or sources in this section, except on line seven, a business in the dairy sector may apply for a grant under subdivision B1B, provided that the award is not for the same documented COVID-19 related economic loss covered under other assistance from the fund. What that means specifically is if a dairy business receives um, CRF monies from another source not in this section, it can go to the Working Lands Enterprise Board to request a grant to adapt or change its business model um, due to changes in its market or supply chain. So it's a very targeted uh, exception to the general rule that um, businesses can really only go to one source as far as this section of law is concerned. Under two, um, commerce tax partners need to provide businesses with guidance and support to help identify the appropriate programs for which the business may be eligible for assistance. Under E, these are just standard provisions that say that who gets the money and how much are public records under one, but under two and three, um, if, it's, uh, if it includes financial uh, tax numbers or information like that federal ID numbers, then and this is under E2 on the next page, then that's um, considered return information and protected. And then three, uh, data about um, cost and expenses of a business is considered a trade secret under the Public Records Act and is not open to inspection. So under 10B here, a new section, this is this was just much longer than the other ones. This came from Natural Resources. That's why it's broken out in its own section. It just really sets up that Outdoor Recreation Business Assistance Program. But the money is above. This is just sort of the standard and it's 
you know, any business that does outdoor recreation, they have to do an application. Grants are a max of 30,000. Um, you know, it's first come first serve after accounting for geographic distribution. A lot of the same standard provisions. I don't feel the particular need to dig into the details here unless you really want to. Um, again, this is this is just straight from natural resources commerce did not change it. And I did not write it, Michael O'Grady did. Um, so can we move on to 10C, I believe? Yes, we can move on. I was just telling Representative Marcotte he needed to send this to the clerk's office, so I apologize for- No, no worries, no worries. Um, let's see, keep going. All the way to the next section. Page 16. All right, so just to give you a sense of what's happening here, this just sets up the framework and statute for the Better Places crowd granting program. Um, it, while there is a million dollars technically allocated or appropriated to DHCD and in and you know through the framework of this, um, this is not the full program and funding that the administration requested. They had asked for $5 million for various purposes for this program. Um, the Congress proposal just has the million to buy public health uh, equipment and help facilitate communities with being safe in public venues. This just sets up the statutory framework for GHCD at a future time to be able to use crowdfunding for, um, you know, uh, public space making, but there's no, otherwise there's no appropriation to this uh, program along the lines of what the administration requested. Um, so we can keep going. So the, this is, again, this is all just setting it up in statute. They do applications, they can use a fiscal agent, they can use crowd granting, they work with communities, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can keep going to the next section, I think. Uh, aha. So this sets the worker's compensation rate of contribution for the year. Um, that's what I know about that. <laughs> These next two pieces are Damien's. I'm not sure if he's with us, but uh, I'm sure Representative Mark and Kimball and Sullivan can speak to these if you want. So that's, again, this is for the next year. You have to do this annually, sets the rate. I think it's the same as last year. And then the next uh, section is the hazard pay uh, grant program at $20 million, um, which I think I'll defer to uh, the commerce members to address if they care to. Um, we will address it all at the end. I, I, if we could just finish the walkthrough, that would be. That, this I'm, is it. David. That's that, the rest that, of it. Um, okay, that's the end of it for the half. Can we all come back to our uh, the full screen, Teresa? Thank you. I think we all have copies of the bill in front of us as well or on another device. And so are there any questions? Um, the hazard pay is a new addition uh, from some of the original work that the committee is, has now considered and brought onto the bill. Are there any questions for the chair or for other members of the committee or for Ledge Council? Um, I would ask the chair, um, there, there's a possible amendment that may be on the floor. I am wondering if, um, if the committee took an informal position on uh, the amendment from uh, Representative Coburn. We have not, um, the committee has not gone through that yet. Um, we will do that um, after we um, finish here. We'll go back to committee to um, listen to uh, Representative Coburn and her um, look at her amendment. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I have a question from Representative Iacovoni. Thank, yes, thank you. Uh, the 70 million that's appropriated, is, it, is, it, is there a limit in the statute as to how much uh, um, applicant may receive? No, that's, that, that, 
would that would be will be set by the agency of commerce and tax um through s350 thank you thank you dave uh peter so thank you and mike thank you so um there's 70 million just i wanted to ask a question about that as well so you've got 70 million dollars here that is added on top of if memory serves 50 million dollars for businesses that have suffered uh, economic harm. The first 50 was 75% harm, and this 70 million is 50% harm. Is that correct? And and um, what did you get any sense in your committee of what the the total need was mounting up to? Um, mostly correct. Um, actually, S350 was 70 million. Gotcha. It was broken into 50 million to tax, 20 million to ACCD. Um, gotcha. This is another 70 million um, where we're leaving it at their discretion after they get some data back from those grants going out um, on the first tranche of money um, so that they can adjust um, where they see the need um, coming up the most. And um, of course, that can't be done. Uh, it has to have the approval of joint fiscal before they can, uh, they can allocate those funds. And we have not. Um, we have not received any any data of any kind of what the need is out there. I think we we anecdotally know that it's not going to be enough, um, but um, I think it'll it certainly will help some businesses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter and Mike. Um, I have Mary and then Dave. So two questions, um, do, how many businesses are there that could potentially be eligible for these grants? And I guess that's a question of saying how many businesses are there in Vermont that and therefore they would be eligible? I think upwards of 60,000. That's what I was guessing. And then totally different subject, but you're, you're setting the comp rates. Um, any thoughts? I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Just do the math, but I need to pay attention. So it's it's what we do every year. We mm -hmm. somehow it, and it's hard to believe that we missed it, <laughs> but usually it's done uh, um, jointly with with uh, ways and means. Um, this is the same rate that we set last year. So it hasn't gone up or hasn't gone down. And um, we just need to set it every yeah. year. And, and you've, you've talked to ways and means about it. About I did, I, I had a conversation with the chair and, and um, she thought we had done it also, but apparently we hadn't. Okay. We had, well, I think it was on the radar and ready to go, but never, yeah. never was inserted into the language. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I am uh, Maida, and then back to Dave. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Mike, I've looked at the hazard pay section 10, what is it, 10E, just really quickly. Um, are the, I, I know there was a lot of conversation along the way with regard to the grocery workers. Are they included here or not? They are not. Um, that was one of the big issues um, that we had um, previously, yeah. because the the guidance that we were looking at um, seemed to be telling us that we could not use those funds, but it wasn't direct. Um, but we were trying to be prudent and didn't really take the bill up until we received guidance that said we cannot use it for um, for grocery workers. Although it's only for high and very high risk. Um, employees in that that the federal uh, guidance allows that those funds to be dispersed as hazard pay. So before you, that's what we have whittled it down to um, is the high and very high uh, risk employees um, face of front facing the facing the public. Thank you for that explanation. I know that's going to be disappointing to an awful lot of folks. It was disappointing. Yes. It was disappointing to us too. Um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, we were hoping that we would be able to get some, some of that hazard payout to um, 
people that are still front facing, but not facing as much of a risk. And generally those are lower paid employees that could have really used the money, but yeah. uh, unfortunately the federal government's not allowing it. But, well, thank you for trying. Thank you, <laughs> um, di thank you Maida. Uh, Diane? Um, thank you, Mike. So I've had people who are uh, bank tellers who have been handling uh, cash and in front, do, would they qualify? No. Hmm. Okay, um, that was a quick answer. Um, is the, a follow-up, Diane? Are there any other questions? Um, uh, Representative O'Sullivan. I think, Madam Chair, I just wanted to pop in and say, the federal guidelines are very specific that the way you can look at it is physically you have to be in the presence of COVID-19. I mean, you've got to be hands-on, respiratory therapist, nursing home, that, and that they're very, that it's unfortunate. It would be lovely to expand it, but they're very clear. You literally have to be physically handing, handling a COVID-19 patient or be close to one. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Representative Townsend, do you have a, it's just up from before. Are there any other uh, questions or comments uh, for the chair or for the committee? Okay, um, if not, um, is the committee ready to take a, a vote on um, this bill and then we will uh, then, um, I, I'm not, do we take a, um, and then we'll work on the amendment. On the amendment. But if the amendment hasn't been proposed, yeah, we'll still take a vote on the amendment. Um, even though it hasn't been proposed, I think that we, we still vote on it because the, the amendment, Selena, is will be. Is that correct? It's on the table. You may take it off the table later. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. And I believe I'm going to, I'm visiting the Commerce Committee as soon as they um, as soon choose to jump off this call. Okay, thank you. Further discussion. Uh, so are there any other final comments or questions uh, or clarification that is needed from the chair or the team that he brought with him or from Ludge Council? If not, I would yep. entertain a motion. Representative Lanfer. Uh, uh, represent. I would like to move that we report favorably on the amendment to H966 as presented by Representative Mark Hutton all. Thank you, Representative Lanfer. Is there a second? Second. I have a second from Linda. Linda. Thank you. So the motion has been made and seconded to accept the amendment to H966 as offered by Representative Marcotte at all. Um, are there any final comments? Clarification needed or questions to be answered. If not, the clerk shall call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Conquest. Chip, you're muted. Sorry, yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Yes. Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Iacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. That's an 11 0 0 on this. And this will be presented on the floor by Linda. Um, well, it'll be presented, be presented by, by the committee. And Linda, you will speak to the amendment, um, the vote, and uh, you'll just do a broad statement and then uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction will walk through the sections of the bill. Okay. So you may want to yield to the member from, uh, not the member from Marcotte, but the member uh, from Hawthorne. Actually be the member from Burlington, I think. So it's representative. Gene, well, I, I will, I'm just going to give an introduction and outline of the bill. Then and then Jean, you okay. Yeah, Jean, Jean is uh and, and several others will be giving um the floor report. Okay. So, so we okay. don't worry about that. And Linda, you'll start out, yield to Mike, and then their committee will follow. So we have an amendment that was brought to our committee earlier at 8:30 this morning. Um, from the representative from are you 
Burlington or South Burlington? You're Burlington, Selena, right? Burlington. Burlington, thank you. Um, uh, and the amendment um, we have reviewed, we have asked some questions. Is there any other further clarification or comments that any member would like to um, make regarding the amendment? Okay, um, if not, uh, maybe. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to say that I, I believe the issue is terrifically important, but I, I am very troubled at the prospect of it being moved here for only this uh, very narrow application uh, with regard to our, our working population. In my mind, it's an issue that um, could be brought up overall, not just with this narrow focus. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Representative Iacoboni. Th thank you. Um, uh, I've, I've been grappling with this because uh, I want to support it, but for the same reasons uh, Maida articulated, and I think Mary alluded to earlier, um, I'm not, I, I worry about the unintended consequences that I'm not aware of. But having said that, what makes it a bit easier for me not to support it is the hazardous pay uh, section of the bill that's here now that wasn't there uh, yesterday, at least not in the many versions I had. And while that's not perfect in terms of providing relief for Vermonters, um, I can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So in any, in any event, um, for those reasons, I'm, I'm hesitant. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, any other final questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'd like to move that we report favorably the amendment to H966 as presented by Representative Colburn. Okay, before I take a second, I, I wanna make sure that I have, that I can do this. I, uh, Representative Colburn raised her hand just as you started to talk, uh, Diane. So I'm going to interrupt the motion and, uh, take, and uh, take your comments, Selena. Um, and I could offer my comments now or after after your vote, but having been called on, I'll just do it now. I was just going to say I really appreciated the um, suggestion from Representative Cooper earlier about the possibility of looking at these or similar criteria as part of the veggie and veto programs. And I, I think a, a commitment from this committee to to really delve into that issue and the budget that we'll look at in the coming year would would help me a lot in terms of feeling like I could withdraw this amendment. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And those budgets, Vita and Veggie, which member uh, do those fall into? Linda, they're within your purview. Um, we, we will take, we'll circle back around with that later. Um, but your point um, I, it will be noted, thank you. Mary? Well, I have a mechanical -ish question. Can we vote on the amendment since we don't really have it yet? Well, um, and you're just well, trying to get us through the process. Um, well, we do, we do, um, the, the amendment is on the floor and we vote on amendments all the time before they're uh, on the floor. We ask for people who are coming, who are bringing okay. amendments to come forth. So yes, we can. Um, so I am now looking for a second. We'll go back to the motion. It was, um, do I have a second? Linda seconded it. <laughs> no, no, she, <laughs> she did not. <laughs> so uh, the motion, uh, is to oh uh, I'm sorry that was a different one that was yes. a different one Peter I different. second it thank you the motion has been made and seconded to vote favorably on the uh, Coburn amendment to H 966 any further comments or questions okay uh, the clerk shall call the roll representative conquest no representative Fagan no 
Representative Feltis. No. Representative Helm. No. Representative Hooper. No. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. No. Representative Myers. No. Representative Townsend. No. Representative Iacovone. No. Representative Toll. No. Great. One, two, that's um, Selena, please, um, the, the, the vote, I, I think you understand the, the dynamics that were within the vote and, um, and Mary did bring up a suggestion and I'm going to ask her to follow up with the committee member in charge of those budgets and, um, and, and whether it's an August issue or a January issue will determine, will determine that. Yeah. It, and I Thank just, you. Uh, Mary? I just wanted to say that my no vote was with the intention of following yes. through. I heard Representative Colburn suggest that there was another path and um, I appreciate that. And so I look forward to working with them and the other committees of jurisdiction to figure out a better way to accomplish this. Thanks. Mine, mine too, I'd like to echo that. Excellent. I feel strongly mm -hmm. about that. And, and Mary, I did task you with that too, to do the follow up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very much, Selena. And thank we'll you see. all, thank you. Appreciate thank the you. discussion and the thoughtful consideration of this. And when I know thank time you. is really short, so thank you. Yep, we're, we're juggling, but we haven't, well, I'm sure we've dropped some balls, but we're trying not to. Um, so um, H349, um, H um, if, uh, Mary, if you could get your, um, your pieces to John Gannon, that would be great because if they vote on that today, um, I, I, I just want to hear about the dairy bill. What's the status of that ship? Do you know when the dairy, um, do you know when uh, the House and Senate Ag Committees are close to determining what should be in and out of that? Um, they were meeting this morning. Um, which I was invited, but we were doing the Commerce Bill. Um, so I don't know the outcome of that. Uh, I, 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 my, my understanding is that they were just about to all say yes to everything, but I'll, I'll find out um, and they may have done it already. So um, I would like to check back in at uh, two o'clock. I know it's a Friday, but if we can check back in at two o'clock and if these two bills have been voted by committee, we're, I think we're, we're ready. We're ready to uh, proceed with an up or down vote. And um, that way we would have all of these pieces off our table for the weekend. And I, and I think to save all of you from endless phone calls from me, you, you might like to come back at two o'clock Friday then hear from me all weekend about proceeding with these two votes. <laughs> did, did you notice that she was threatening us? <laughs> No, she was just throwing up know. parameters. Uh, <laughs> can I ask a question before we split here for the floor? Yes, yes. Do, do we have, through JFO or wherever, the most current, which would be through of today, the, the most current um, tracking of how we've spent one point, however much it's been of the 1.25 billion. Maria, would you get us that? I know, I, I think that that is, that is updated. Would you mind yes. sending that out when you have a chance? Thank you. I will, yep. Okay, yes, that you. would be great, thank you. And the good news from the committee is we have covered um, except taking a position on Diana's, Diana, Diane's piece uh, on the AG's office, we have covered all parts of the quarter year budget changes in the Senate. We've had the walkthrough with Stephanie. Um, all of you have met with your committee of jurisdiction. All of you have worked on the pieces. And so when we get that, if there are questions, you need to get those to me over the weekend because I think we have done a full circle several times um, on the quarter year. Do you want me to mention the fact that, that I think the attorney general piece is cleared up? Yes, let's take that off the table. Okay. Quickly. That would be I, I had a conversation with the attorney general's office yesterday 
told them about the, the, the Senate's return bill that's got $50,000 going to the director of racial equality. And I got the okay that they are fine with that. They are fine with that. They have some other things that they're working on with the Burlington High School that, that will keep them busy, but I don't think it's the time to bring anything in around mm -hmm. that. But just so you know, they're fine with it. It's $50,000, although we could make it 30 if you want, Madam Chair, but the, the Attorney General's office is gave me the green light that that is acceptable for them. So it's done. Thank you, Diane, for that update. So we say. And, okay, and Kitty, yes. uh, can I give my update with regard to the policing amendment? Uh, very quickly, because yep. there's something on the floor. Yep, okay, so for everyone's uh, knowledge. I caught up with uh, Commissioner Sterling last night and he assured me that he is in full support of that policing amendment, which was added before third re or on third reading over in the Senate. Um, and he reminded me also that all the concepts in that amendment are in the, um, the modernization plan that he presented to us and to other committees back in January. So underscoring full support from DPS on that amendment. And I've let all the committees, the chairs and of the committees of jurisdiction know of that support. Thank you, Meta. So I think you've all done your full circle and made sure everyone knows if you think of a committee or a member that needs to know a piece that, that is in there that you haven't followed up with, make sure to do that um, you know, by the end of day Monday. All right, we need to jump on the floor. I'll see everybody back at two o'clock. You work on dairy and work on uh, S349 and you guys maybe may have a great weekend.